Hello, everyone. We just started the webinar. We're going to wait just a few more minutes to allow people to hop on. Hello, welcome to our webinar. We are just going to wait a few more minutes. We still have people coming in, so we just want to make sure they're able to come into the webinar before we start. And we will start at 11.01, um, just giving everybody a few more minutes. I still see people funneling in. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started on our presentation today. Thank you so much for joining us. I am Desiree Moore. I am the Director of Marketing and Strategic Growth here at Peregrine Global Services. And on the line with me, I have my valued colleague, Cassie Reich. She'll be moderating the chat for us today. Uh, so that way, if there are any questions at the end, she can share those with us. Thank you again for coming and listening to Digital Transformation and Higher Education. I worked in higher education for about eight years as a faculty member and administrator. And as an administrator, I took an active role in driving digital transformation, changing the way that we provided education to our students in order to enhance the experience, especially some of our non-traditional students. And so this is just happens to be a passion of mine and something that I really enjoy. So we're gonna talk about the state of digital transformation today and where I see it going. And then I'm also gonna provide you with some very helpful and small tech tips that kind of make it just easier uh, to manage your day to day and per increase productivity, all of those good things. Also, I want to just thank you. I thank AUPHA. AUPHA is the sponsor of this webinar or our partner in providing this webinar to you. Uh, they are a valued thought partner of ours. And so just a quick thank you to them. Okay. So here is a before and after picture from last year. When the pandemic hit, I taught college English as an adjunct at a small community college. Like a lot of you, I have a soft spot for my students and every semester I would get their permission to take a class photo. As you can see on the left, we are very happy and very connected. In the photo on the right side, I'm frowning at my empty Zoom meeting. Um, I took this photo on April 2nd with the caption, waiting for my students to visit me online. It isn't mandatory, mandatory that they do so, but I sure hope that they would stop in to chat and ask questions. This was the reality for a lot of us. We were suddenly forced to change the way we taught and we learned a lot of lessons the hard way. We all felt that we were thrown into a super sprint of digital transformation when our campuses closed their doors in a matter of a week or two, and in most cases, faculty were asked to be ready and start teaching students online. It felt like everything transpired overnight. The switch to online instruction, the technology learning curve, and the resolution of access and connectivity issues. Like I said, that wasn't mandatory for my students to come because I wanted to make it as asynchronous as possible so that it was accessible for them and whatever barriers they were facing at home but it also wasn't necessarily effective because I sat in an empty Zoom meeting. Digital transformation is the transformation of an institution's core functions to better meet learners' needs by leveraging technology and data. Therefore, to simply use technology, like I did, does not meet the standards necessary for digital transformation. We must adapt technology 
to or adopt technology to improve the learner experience and improve learning outcomes. And this is essential. We know that online technology is the most powerful tool we have for reaching people all around the world. It is amazing to me today that I can meet with anyone who has an internet connection, see their face, exchange ideas, and connect from opposite sides of the globe. Given that higher education often has a mission that is ethically grounded, we have the want and the ability to make education more inclusive than ever before. We know that common narrative about higher education, that we are slow to adopt new technology and innovative ways of delivering education. I think during our recent pandemic, higher education institutions around the world proved this narrative wrong. With the help of major tech companies, we have revolutionized online education. I was once an online student for the second half of my undergraduate and all of my master's degree. My education was all asynchronous. And although I think it was good and I learned a lot, I believe that with the innovations that have come out of 2020, the next generation of learners are going to have an even better, richer, and higher quality experience when it comes to online learning. Now, online learning is not the only function of a co college or university that is impacted by the recent disruption. There are many goals to digital transformation, and what you see here are the most common ones seen today. Although I do believe that the area of higher education that will be most permanently rewired um, is that area in which we teach and we learn. But here are some areas that will be impacted by digital transformation. And so this gives you a more holistic view of it. Enhanced student experiences. This focuses on improving student metrics like retention and graduation rates, course success rates, and other markers that prove overall success. The enhancement of student experience includes everything from tech to support early intervention, improved online content and scaffolding, using technology to deepen the connection between classmates in an online setting, and creating new models for the fi at, or finally using models of education that have shown great results, such as a flipped classroom model. I've designed a couple of those throughout my career. Peregrine has been helping higher education professionals with this particular goal of providing engaging online content that is easily integrated into an online classroom. I will talk just briefly about that towards the end of the webinar. And then improved competitiveness. This goal focuses on differentiating an institution from the competition by using digital avenues. Improved competitiveness can come in a variety of forms, such as improved student experience and learning outcomes, but also our marketing and admissions office ability to use the digital world to tell the institution's story and communicate an, about an institution and their program's value in the digital space. Think social media, websites. Then there's create a culture of data-driven decision-making. And I think this one is very important. Um, we need to make data-driven decision. And this includes adopting a digital mindset across all areas of the campus for students, faculty, leadership, and other staff members. Making good decisions is so much easier today based on the ability to collect and make data easy to understand. For example, here at Peregrine, we have a variety of assessment services that produce high quality data on relative soft skill proficiency and program specific retained knowledge. Our platform turns all of this data into digestible charts and tables that schools use to improve program effectiveness, better develop students, and meet accreditation requirements. Again, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more briefly at the end of the webinar. And then finally, optimize resources. This covers everything from improving communication between administrators to cutting costs related to electricity usage to utilizing technology to create more sustainable systems for faculty who teach online or in hybrid models of delivery. So digital transformation is, and what it can do for an institution is quite robust. And there seems to be a major surge in the number of hybrid models 
actually, I want to go back for just a second. I just forgot a point that I wanted to make. So it's quite robust, but in order to effectively make digital transformation happen, because there's so many ways that, that an institution can go, whether it's enhancing the student experience or building capacity uh, for your institution, is, is really the institution needs to dig into what are their goals, right? What is, what is the biggest goal that you have and how can digital transformation get you there? We're going to talk a little bit more about that, but I didn't want to leave this slide without saying that because I want to talk a little bit about hybrid learning because there seems to be a major surge in the number of hybrid models of education that exist today. Hybrid programs are actually were quite rare a couple years ago, but right now they seem to be the most popular mode of delivering education. Um, and this is because hybrid education is flexible. Uh, it's a reimagined learning experience that allows all learners to succeed and enables education to continue regardless of external obstacles. I bet some of you on this webinar can take today can remember some of the external obstacles that we faced over the last year and a half. They also are multimodal and interactive. Um, they're flexible enough to include all types of learners, and it's really easy to take a blended approach and make it adhere to universal desi design, making it more accessible to all types of learners. You can offer it in both a synchronous and asynchronous environment. Uh, Blended hybrid learning allows you to carefully scaffold to guide learning effectively. Um, we have provided webinars on how to scaffold education or what scaffolding even means in education, uh, and we'll continue to produce more of those. So just keep an eye out for the webinars on our website, and we also have a newsletter you can sign up for if that's something you're interested in. And then also they're conducive to active engagement, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that as well. So what is the impact that this innovation has had thus far? The increase in hybrid programs, the drive of digital transformation, the improvement of resources, technological resources for enhancing the student experience. Our recent move to online has increased the number of hybrid courses, like I said, and programs available to learners, making learning much more accessible. Previously, a faculty member may have structured um, an in-person course lecture for one hour class to be 50 minute lecture with 10 minute Q&A. Imagine it, right? You go into a classroom or maybe you're the teacher or the student and the, the instructor stands in front of the class and lectures for 50 minutes and at the end there's maybe some Q&A. Maybe the instructor allows Q&A throughout the lecture, but really that's what it looks like. So it's only really 10 minutes of active engagement, where the other 50 minutes is passive engagement, right? The students are in the classroom being passively fed the information. And of course, that, that puts the students in a, um, in, in, a, in a passive seat. But when we've changed it to be blended, right, which or even more online than it is it was before, within this hybrid model, students are spending less time within the passive role and more time actively learning and engaging. So if you were to fill that one hour course with online content, it would look like this. Video lecture, 20 minutes. Reading, 20 minutes. Self-testing, which has proven to be a very a very um, effective way of helping learners retain knowledge uh, to reinforce concepts 10 minutes and then virtual Q&A more discussion based for 30 minutes. In this scenario, the learner is spending as much time actively learning as they are passively learning, but the amount of time that the instructor is spending standing in front of a classroom decreases significantly. So it, it, there's more learning going on. It's more active. Um, but it's not necessarily 100% dependent on the faculty member to deliver that education passively, but more for the students to participate in learning and for faculty to facilitate that learning um, through an online platform. So I'm going to skip that. So let's discuss some tips for embracing digital transformation. I touched on this before, just, you know, because I said digital transformation is so broad. There's so many different objectives. There's so many ways that you can drive digital transformation to improve the student experience, help your institution, help your faculty and staff and leadership. Um, and really to drive digital transformation, you have to create a culture of digital transformation. And digital transformation is not and should not 
be our reaction to change. And it was this last time, but instead it should be proactive measure taken to improve the way we operate. And so I like to say that we were before with the pandemic, it was a sprint and we need to change that into a marathon. We need to have continuous proactive change and we don't stop here. Communication, change management and collaboration are the largest indicators of whether your digital initiatives will be successful. And before any institution can implement a successful digital transformation strategy, they need concrete goals to work towards, right? Um, so you may get excited about all kinds of different things that will help you towards digital transformation, but you need to start with your goals and then uh, put together the objectives and the tactics that support those goals. And think of digital transformation as a method of becoming the next Netflix or Apple of education. And this is an analogy I really enjoy. Do any of you remember Blockbuster? Well, I do. So when, and, and, and this is going to tell you my age, but when I was a child and an adolescent, we had Blockbuster. And it was that place that you would go to rent a movie. And if you failed to return it on time, they would charge you a whole bunch of late fees, right? And that is really how they made their money. And we all know that. Netflix looked at Blockbuster's business model and said, I hate paying late fees, so I want to develop a business that can cut costs in such a way that it's not dependent on the late fees to, to cover expenses and make a profit. Using what technology was available at the time, they did it by making movies a mail order process. Then as tech evolved, they evolved with it, right? So they didn't just react at that time. They were proactive. They turned their sprint of using the current technology to get where they needed to be to being proactive to continue and continuing to innovate and grow with technology. And so as tech evolved, they evolved with it. And today other entertainment related companies are trying to capture some of what Netflix did. Another example is Apple. When Apple brought forward the iPhone, it disrupted everything. There was a lot of BlackBerry fans out there, but people will flock to the best experience possible, okay? And that is what the iPhone, just like Netflix, provided. Now you will see that BlackBerry is no longer the most popular option for a mobile device. And the computer company that thought way out of the box is a staple in our society. This is all to say that technology is at our disposal and we as educators can be something great. We can do something great. We have the resources to disrupt higher education in such a way that it improves the student experience um, and in a way that we've never imagined before. We can, we can do the unimaginable if we utilize the resources that we have at our fingertips. So now that we are, we're kind of wrapping up talking about digital transformation, I actually want to share some really fun tech tips with you. And then we're going to talk a little bit more about um, some digital transformation and some of the solutions at Peregrine, here at Peregrine, we provide to help you advance digital transformation. So you can still see my screen. So some of these are just really small tech tips, um, but I think they're really fun. And they're things I, I use all the time. And so here's a Word document with an image in it. And this works in PowerPoint as well. So usually when I want to copy an image, I will control C and control V, right? Control copy, control paste. But did you know you can just click control D for duplicate? So that reduces the number of, and it's, it's copying down here. And that reduces the number of, of clicks, which is always very nice. All right, so here is another one. This one is one of my favorites. I call it daily bookmarks. So when, when I worked in higher education, there were things that I opened up every single day, right? So we had an early alert system um, so for student success. So that was something I opened up every day. Um, just to check on my students and how they were progressing um, through our student support system. I also had my learning management system. I had various websites I would use. And so it would be so nice if those daily websites, those things I opened every single day, like my email even, um, I could just open in one click, right? So something you can do is you can add 
and I don't know if you guys can see this. Let me move that. Perfect. So you can add your favorites, right, to your bookmarks bar. Right now I'm in Microsoft Edge, but it works the same in Chrome. Okay, so let's say Slide Carnival. Um, we're going to go over this in just a moment. It's a website that you can pull fun presentation slides from. The one you're looking at today, the one I'm using today, um, came from Slides Carnival. Let's say I use this all the time, and I'm going to use it every day, and I want to add it to my everyday folder. So I'm going to go ahead and add it. It's called a favorite in Microsoft Edge, a bookmark in Chrome. And so I'm going to add that to the folder tech tips right here. And so if I click on that, there it is. And normally we'd click on our folder in our bookmarks bar and we'd click on all of the individual websites that we want to open. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click and click open all six. And I can open all of the websites that I need on a daily basis all at one time. So that's also a really fun productivity um, tip that I have for you. One that I really like and that is very useful is you don't always have access to um, the, the licensed Adobe, right? So Adobe Read, you may have just Adobe Reader. And so you may have a PDF like this one. And you may say, okay, I need to, I just need the um, abstract. That's all I want to share with my students. I just want to share the abstract with them. But of course, this document has 168 pages. And if you don't have all this stuff that you see on the right hand side, because you don't have the paid version of it, 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 it can be kind of difficult. A lot of us will like print this and then we'll take out the pages we need and then scan them and then upload them into our learning management system. And that's just, it's really clunky. So let me show you a really quick tip for pulling out a couple pages if you don't have the paid version of Adobe. So what we're going to do is I'm gonna close this. And here is the document here on my screen. And you're just gonna right click this, okay? And you're gonna go to open with and I forgot to mention before I keep going, I do have all of these tech tips plus more in a very, um, very easy to use four page document that I will send you after the webinar. So um, just so you know, but uh, so I can click open with and I can open with one of my web browsers. So I'm using Chrome and Microsoft Edge. So I'm going to go ahead and use Chrome. They both work. So here's Chrome, it opened up in Chrome, I had to pull it over to the side. And I'm going to hit the print icon. But of course, I, I don't actually want to print this, I, I just want to extract a couple pages. So I said I wanted the abstract, it looks like the abstract is on page two, and page three. So I'm going to go to pages, and I'm going to click custom. And then I'm going to say two through three is what I want or I could even do two comma three since I'm just doing those two pages. And then it just shows me this, right? The two pages I selected. And you can do as many pages as you want. And then I'm going to change my destination from my printer to Adobe PDF. And then I'm gonna click print. And that is going to, and don't look at how much I have in my desktop, it's a lot. Um, I'm, I'm really bad at cluttering my desktop. I'm gonna go ahead and click my desktop and hit save. And so right now it is, it has, it has saved that to my desktop as a PDF with just those two pages. So I can upload it into my learning management system and my students will only receive the pages that I want them to receive. Okay, so that's another really useful tip. Um, here is one more. And so we have YouTube a right here. Academic tradition. And let's the say I wanna share students name this video with someone, represents your but I don't want all this stuff. I don't want them to Every see. Every degree received. I don't want them to see all of the, like, of the recommended videos. I, I, I want it to be clean, right? So I want to put a link in my learning management system because we know that we can't load the video into our learning management system because what that ends up doing is making our learning management system very heavy. And so what we need to do is we need to um, we need to link it out, but I want it to be clean. So in order to do that, I have my YouTube URL right here, and you can see that. If you put a hyphen between the T and the U, I'm going to do that right now. Okay. So there is a hyphen between the T and the U. Hit enter, and you copy and paste your link in like that. A sacred academic tradition. 
when your students open that link from your learning management system, they're going to get a full screen, clean video, and they're not going to get all the stuff on the side and the comments and things. Um, they're just going to get this, which is really, really nice. One other thing that I use all the time because I'm a keyboarder, some people are mousers, some people are keyboarders, is I like to navigate from tab to tab. Now I am not using my mouse, I'm using my keyboard. So control one, control two, control five. So I can navigate to the different tabs up there using control and the number. All right. And then this one is really helpful. I don't know when the pandemic hit at first, I just had my laptop. I didn't have a secondary screen. I think a lot of us have adopted a secondary screen. So I was trying to like grade paper. So I had my customized rubric that was built into my learning management system, but I had the paper over here. And so I'm like reading the paper and going back to my rubric. And I was doing this back and forth thing um, over and over and over again. And it was really obnoxious. And so then I would try to fit the two screens into my laptop screen so that I can see it. But I learned this really handy trick. I think it's handy. Maybe you already know it, but if you hit your window key, now this doesn't, there is a way to do it for Mac, but I'm going to show you um, the PC version because that is what I'm, or Windows version, because that is what I'm familiar with. So window and then left key, right? And then it will pop up all of the ones you can select. So I want my browser window to be next to that PDF that we worked with earlier. And then I don't have to sit there and try to expand and shrink and, and move those around. Um, it just, they fit very nicely and you can work on two different things at one time. And I think that is the end of the tech tips. I do have more, like I said, um, there's things for Zoom. I have some tech tips for Zoom and some tech tips for PowerPoint and Excel. The Zoom ones are things like if I were to briefly, if I were to hold down my um, mute, my my space bar, it will temporarily mute me, which is really nice because I'm working from home and I have dogs and I have children. And sometimes I need to be temporarily muted. Okay, so I also want to stress the importance of even though digital transformation is super exciting, um, it's also important to remember those low tech options for higher education um, that, that we have. Um, they're still even available in the middle of a pandemic or in an online learning environment. Um, and so learning effectiveness programs are designed to benefit students with learning differences, whether it be one-on-one -on -one, academic counseling, um, help with academic workloads and subject specific tutoring. It's really important that we offer those things to our learners, writing centers um, that provide tutoring and guidance on class assignments, research papers, multimedia projects, or any other challenges of higher education, academic advising, and personal connection. Those are just, those are things that technology can help us facilitate, um, but they're not, they, they can't replace a person, right? We need a person to help with those things. Um, we need that connection. And I can't stress enough um, the, the importance of personal connection. Um, maybe that's a phone call, a friendly smile at the end of a video lecture, or a simple word of encouragement can go a long way and really help a student feel connected and engaged in their learning. So I want to give you the opportunity um, while I go through some of the solutions that Peregrine provides um, to add a super cool tech tip that you may have in the chat box, something you may even think is simple, um, but it blows minds anytime you share it with a, a coworker or you just think it's very useful. Um, and then as part of your participation this webinar, we'll compile the list of tech tips and send them out with our follow-up email. So you'll have the ones I already have here today, plus we'll add the ones that you give us in the chat to our document and share them out with everyone. So I said I want to talk just a little bit about what Peregrine provides to aid in digital transformation. We provide digital courseware, so instructional content that can be easily supplement what you're doing in a course. We even have we have faculty who are using our online modules um, as an alternative to a textbook now, which is really neat. Um, even it's they're even more engaging than like online textbooks, which is which I really like. Uh, we have assessments um, that are completely online to measure soft skills and retained knowledge and simulations. Um, we have one main simulation right now, and then we will be we are currently working on a project to roll out more in the next year. 
um, our, our, it's part of our simulation framework. More news to come on that at a way later date, but uh, I get excited about it, so I start talking to it. So the first I want to talk to you about is leading edge learning. Um, and leading edge learning is just a collection of online modules that can be mixed and matched to, match to support the development of eight key workplace competencies, um, including critical thinking and problem solving, oral and written communication, teamwork and collaboration, digital technology, leadership, professionalism and work ethic, career management, and global and intercultural fluency. Now, I know I'm talking to healthcare administration programs right now, and all of those competencies I just named off are probably embedded in your student learning outcomes or directly listed, right? You probably have um, you probably have a learning outcome related to each of those. And we want to help you develop them. So um, we help you develop these competencies by promote um, providing, you know, um, digital content with a variety of media. So modules come in various forms, simulations, micro case studies, dynamic lessons comprising of informative text, video, sound clips, activities, and quizzes. Um, you can pick and choose the solutions that will work best for your classroom, and all modules can be easily integrated into your learning management system. Peregrine Global Services has a really strong um, it's really strong in leadership. We started as a leadership development company actually 17 years ago. And so if leadership is a core part of your program, you're gonna see that we have a lot of instructional content related to business and leadership because those are just our really our strongest areas of expertise plus more. Uh, the modules come in a wide range of sizes, like I said, from two to 135 learner hours. Um, so they can kind of be mixed and match and added to your course to meet your needs. Uh, we often will develop kind of a course pack um, with our higher education thought partners um, so that they can integrate those into your, their learning management system and use them as a supplement for their class or to replace a textbook. Uh, the assortment of media type and size ensures that faculty can easily incorporate these modules and it enhances the student experience and saves faculty time on developing content so they have the time needed to deliberately participate in student engagement and provide that connection that is so important. One of the modules we have is a simulation. It is called One Day. Um, I've, I've worked with a couple business, or I worked with a couple healthcare administration programs that at the um, at the master's level they are teaching business strategy, right? And that's very important. And this is what this module is all about. It's about strategy, and it really helps develop those key workplace skills like critical thinking and problem solving um, by doing and interacting within a real real world business environment. So one day is a multi-episode learning experience. It's individually played, right? So a lot of simulations require that learners uh, do it as part of a group. But the problem with that is that, as you know, um, and, and it revealed to us through this pandemic, is that not all students have equal access to technology. And so sometimes having to do it within a group setting can be a barrier to success. Um, it follows Emma, a young employee of a um, of North South Airlines, as she navigates through the game, gathering information from various characters and other sources. Her goal, or the goal for learners, is to choose a strategy for the airline, prioritize supporting actions, add supporting statements, and build an argument to present to the CEO. Players build the information they need in episodes one through five and organize that information for presentation in episode six. Uh, we last year, our company um, asked us employees all to play one day and we did and you know so I'm the director of marketing and strategic growth so I thought oh, I'm going to breeze through this right what's really interesting about the simulation is you can't just breeze through it you can't just click through right the simulation forces you to engage. Um, because if you're not collecting information, you're not connect, collect, collecting learnings, you're not going to make good decisions in the next episode. And it's going to say, oh, gosh, it looks like you need to replay this. Um, so it really forces you to pay attention. And I actually learned a lot from the simulation about strategy that I'm now using in my everyday uh, work life. Um, and so I, I kind of jumped ahead. I did this when I taught all the time. I would discuss the slide in front of me because I would get so excited and I would say everything I was going to say in the next slide. Um, but 
because learners are forced to engage in the simulation, right? And the, it's supposed to be iterative in nature. They're supposed to have to play episodes one or two or three times. It makes not just the information, but the skills they're developing stick. Right, so it's great for retained knowledge and skill development. And throughout the simulation, learners will be quizzed in various forms about concepts related to strategy. So there's some embedded assessment, which is really nice. Um, there's um, in course readings, and you can actually customize those as a faculty member. So if you want students to read various things about strategy, um, they're asked to prioritize what they've learned, make decisions about what strategy. Uh, to implement based on what they learned and deliver a presentation to the CEO of North South Airlines. All right, so I'm trying to breeze through this as fast as uh, I can um, because I, I don't want to take up all your time talking about our solutions, but we just have so much to offer in the way of digital transformation. And one of our one of the things that we're the most known for is helping institutions assess student learning so they can conduct really meaningful quality assurance. Um, activities. So one of the services that we have to do this is evaluate skills. And evaluate skills assesses soft skills, okay? And it uses a 360 degree approach, which takes the perspective of peers, mentors, um, maybe even colleagues or clients or whoever that person has been around and has experience with them and their various soft skills. And it all online measures as objectively as possible, the soft skills of that particular learner. Um, we know that we call them soft skills. I like to call them professional skills. That's what we should be calling them because they're not soft. They're the hardest skills to teach, right? We know that they're the hardest skills to teach and they're hardest to learn and they're very hard to assess. But Peregrine has worked very um, hard to come up with a solution to help you assess those professional skills. And so a value skills allows you to create really flexible, customizable instruments based on your learning outcomes and what competencies are important to your program. You get to utilize the expertise of our team. Uh, we do this over and over again, where we sit there with you, we look at your learning outcomes, we look at your competencies, and we map them to the skills that are available within our assessment database. We have over 200 skills um, in our database that correspond to rubrics. You can also create your own skills if you find something that doesn't quite match. Um, and you can also write or develop your own, um, you can also write and develop your own rubrics as well to go along with those skills. And I said it was objective, that this allows you to objectively measure. And you may be saying, gosh, Desiree, how does that work? Um, professional skills and proficiency in professional skills is, is really subjective and subject to bias. Um, they lack standard categorization and uh, definition. So how do you do that? Well, it's our rubrics that are associated with each skill. We took a lot of time in developing these and we have a rubric for each one. So let's say um, this one is critical thinking and problem solving skills demonstrates originality and intentiveness. So it's a close-ended five-point Likert scale rubric for each skill that concentrates on the behavior, right? Not the person. I could say, you could say, Desiree, what do you think of Cassie, your colleague's communication skills? And I could say, well, I really like Cassie. Cassie and I get along. So she has excellent communication, right? But when I'm forced to look at her behavior, when there's a statement behavior and scaling statement, when I'm forced to look at that, um, then maybe I don't, I don't say that she's exceptional. Maybe I say she's competent and she meets the expectation based on her behavior. Also, you have the ability to collect written feedback for each assessment item, adding to the richness or of, to the, of the data, or you can do a combination of both. The interface, the online interface is really easy to use. You can create um, and manage various instruments um, to address specific needs in different groups of participants or cohorts. Uh, you can track progress of evaluations, generate reports, manage the entire process. Uh, really, it is so easy to use and very seamless. And then at the end of the assessment period, there are a variety of reports um, that allow you to look at the participant level so you can help that participant grow and develop and, and gain understanding, right? Feedback is a gift. You may have heard that before, but this is feedback and the evaluators are, are confidential. So the participant doesn't know who said what, right? Because we recommend, um, at, well, we require a minimum of a three. We recommend 
five to eight. And so it's confidential and it shows them average scores. Um, and so that helps the student um, gain some self-awareness, realize where they may have gaps and create a plan for continuous improvement. Also, you have group reports, right? And group reports are really nice because you can see if there are competency gaps or professional skills gaps within your program. So maybe you see that one aspect of leadership, your students score really, really low in that. And you know that's really important to your program. So then you can decide what are the, what are we going to do? What are we going to change about our program? Maybe it's because we don't actually provide enough um, opportunity to develop the competency of, let's say, leading teams or something like that throughout the, the duration of our program. So we're going to change that in our program and continue to reassess. Finally, this is the final solution I'm going to share with you, and this is knowledge-based assessments. Um, so we do have a knowledge-based assessment for healthcare administration. It's customizable program-level assessment with in-depth reporting and data analysis to help satisfy assurance of learning requirements. We work closely with AUPHA and CAMI so that we can make sure our assessments meet your certificate or accreditation needs. Um, we do have 23 healthcare administration topics, as you can see here, and then they're grouped into five domains, communications and relationship management, leadership, professionalism, knowledge of the healthcare environment, and business knowledge and skills. These are multiple choice, this is a multiple choice exam, and it is meant to measure the relative retained knowledge of your learners. Um, our test banks are valid and reliable. Um, our questions are aligned with knowledge areas that have been validated and peer reviewed by, by faculty and subject matter experts. Our test banks undergo regular psychometric analysis um, to ensure they're reliable and accurate. And then exam difficulty is relative. It's based on what the student knows at that time. These can be offered 100% online, just like a values, everything we provide, um, because we have a secure online delivery platform with randomized question selection, disabled copy-paste content, timed questions, and monitored activity. And then we do have a 24-7 client admin uh, where, the um, where you can access reports. And we have so many reports. And we're doing a webinar on that, on our reporting capabilities and features uh, very soon. Um, but you have both individual and summative uh, reports and you have access to those at all time. And it's really quite amazing uh, what you can see and, and what you can dissect from your program and where you may be, you know, have a weakness or where you have a strength um, when it comes to various um, the various areas of knowledge that you are trying to ensure your students have um, within your program. So I'm going to stop talking about our solutions for just a moment because I want to offer you something really neat. So I did talk to you about leading edge learning about these modules that we have. Well, I know that with digital transformation, it's a lot about leading change, right? So in order for lead for digital transformation to happen, you have to be able to lead change. So for your professional development, I want to give you free a module that sometimes is used within a classroom um, on leading change. And this module will help you understand how to lead through change in a way that suits fears, keeps your workplace thriving. You will learn tools for changing resistance to excitement, for keeping your team inspired about the change, and for understanding and minimizing the barriers that keep people from embracing change. Okay, so we will give that to you. Just let us know if you would like it. I am going to launch a poll right now. What do you need from us? I hope that this webinar was of value, that you enjoyed the tech tips, that you enjoyed the discussion on digital transformation, but do you want there to be a next step? Um, and that could be guest access to the leadership change module or schedule a free consult with me. We can look at your competencies, your learning outcomes, the challenges you're having with um, just your quality assurance processes and, and, and come up with a solution together. So I'm gonna launch this poll. And I'm just going to give you, okay, a lot of you like <laughs> would like uh, free access to our leading change module. It is a really, it's a very nice module.
All right, and I have a few of you who would like to schedule a free consult. So that's exciting to me. I can't wait to reach out to you. I can't wait to talk to you about your institution and what you're doing and how I can help. So thank you so much. All right, I'm just gonna give it, I usually try to give it a full minute, um, but it looks like, looks like most of you have voted. All right. So I'm gonna end polling. And go ahead. Now, do we have any questions? And I think, Cassie, there were some in the chat, maybe? Uh, we have a question that says, will the PowerPoint and recorded file be um, distributed for later review? It absolutely will be. OK. Okay, and I see another question. Um, it's not in the chat, though. It's in the Q&A. And this question asks, um, does our exams have to be proctored? Uh, no, that is up to the institution. So we've, we've put together, you know, we've used technology to make them as secure as possible, but we realize requiring our exams to be proctored is a barrier for some institutions. Um, so it just depends on the institution whether they require a proctor or not. All right, I have um, another question. And this one is, uh, how, how do you overcome, sorry, I'm going to try to read this. Okay, so what they're asking is with faculty who are new to using technology, kind of how do you overcome that? And I've been there before, right? I had a, an instructor who taught right after me. And so every, every single class at the end of my class, I would have to set up the projector for him because his students in his speech class would need to use it, but he didn't know how to set it up. Um, and so when we went completely online, it was a it was a struggle for him. He really, really struggled to adapt to using technology 100% of the time for his courses. Um, but of course, we were mid-semester, so what choice did we have? And we didn't have anybody to take over his courses. And so as I, I am just one of those people, I'm, I'm naturally helpful, and so I, and I have a good relationship with this other instructor, so I worked with him a lot. And I would just say, be patient, right? Be patient and know that uh, it's, it's okay to take baby steps. And if we can make things as simple as possible for the people that we're working with, not because they can't handle it, they absolutely can't handle it, they can learn new things, but that's a stressful time to pick up new technology. And so um, I would say to overcome it is, 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 to, is to understand what the struggle is, right? Understand what their challenge is and be as patient and as adaptable as possible to the best of your ability. It's not easy, but it is, it is possible. And he made it through the semester, right? The one I talked about, but he just needed some support. So just make sure that support exists for faculty in need. It's really important. All right, is there anything else? I don't see. Oh, I see two more coming through the chat. Okay, how can faculty engage students to attend online courses? Okay, so do you mean show up for um, synchronous? So if you're delivering an online lecture or do you mean just like log in and do their work um, would be my question. The logging in and doing their work, I think that that's, I like to talk about extrinsic and intrinsic motivation, right? And so, an extrinsic motivator is an outside reward or punishment. And it's shown that those are actually not the most effective ways to motivate people, right? Um, and so like bad grades, uh, risk of failing, they will work in the short term, but they, they, they don't work long term. Intrinsic motivators, right, are the things that keep people engaged. So think about how you may enjoy baking bread, right? And the challenge of baking bread and the chemistry behind it. Um, and so you're trying new recipes and doing new things. You're motivated to bake bread because you find joy in it. So we have to embed joy in our classrooms. I, and, and I know that's, that's you know, harder than said than done. Um, you know, I try to embed joy in my children's life. And of course, my teenager doesn't think I'm very fun or funny anymore, but I think I am, right? Because we're at different points in our life. Um, but, but how do you embed? I think you give them a sense of, of, of satisfaction, of fulfillment, 
or and fulfillment. So progress indicators. Um, I think that uh, if you can gamify any of the learning, add not and intrinsic game-based elements. I think also engaging to engage your learners, you have to provide them with multiple kinds of media, right? It can't just be read the textbook and reply to the discussion posts. That's too passive, right? It can't just be listen to the video lecture and then reply to discussion posts. No, we need to really build a robust, right? A very rich and robust learning environment online and we have the technology to do so. And so that's why we've developed the modules we have. So whether that's quizzes to reinforce concepts, a combination of video, um, things that get the point across but are funny, right? Um, things like that. One thing I do with my students, and here's just an idea, right, is we learn about logical fallacies because I teach college English. And I play this, I play this game show and it's called Name That Fallacy. And we have we have buzzers, but now that we're in Zoom land, we have you know the raise your hand fe feature. And I play a commercial, right? I play a commercial that has a fallacy in it. Um, Geico had one called Too Tall Jones, where it's like, can Geico really save you money on car insurance? And then it starts to talk about Too Tall Jones. And that's a red herring because it took the focus went away. It never answered the question, right? The focus went to this guy who's really tall. Um, but I would say, name that fallacy, right? And as soon as I, I said that, they could, they could click it, they could answer the question, and it was a competition. And so that's one way. So I don't know how to get them to log in and show up that way initially I think from the start you can personalize it maybe so send out a video message um, you don't have to tell students everything about your personal life but just enough I mean you've learned in this time that I used to teach in higher education that I'm really excited about digital transformation that I, I'm a mother right I mentioned my kids and, and and really you don't have any information about me but you feel more connected to me because you have just that little bit. And so be willing to open up yourself, open up just a little bit, build that personal connection and make the students not just show up for your class, but show up for you. Um, that's, that's another tip that I have. So lots of little tiny things in there. And I hope you were able to pull something out that you can use. Most of the time, yes, okay them only keep their Zoom open and do their shopping at the same time. Yes, absolutely, right? I mean, and I'm guilty of that. Have you ever been in a meeting, right? You're in an all faculty, all staff meeting, and you're not necessarily doing your online shopping, but you're answering emails or you're doing something else while that is going on. And I remember when I was in, I was actually in a virtual, I had a, they call them virtual cl uh, classes when I was in my undergrad. And it was kind of like, I mean, this was many, many years ago, so it wasn't as good as it is now. And I would wash dishes while I listened to um, my my instructor lecture, right? I was, I was, I was a mom. I was going to school, so I'd wash dishes. And so I, I very much believe that they are probably online shopping. Um, what I would say is, is create a reason for them to be engaged in the discussion, right? Create a reason for them to be in, engaged in the discussion. Uh, create prompts. Create discussions open up the room. Now, I know that getting students to talk is hard. So every time a student does speak, right, every time a student speaks up, I want you to exaggerate your thank you to them. Because and I want you, I want you to exaggerate, I want you to say, I really appreciate it when you speak up, like, even if you're the one who prompted them to do it, can anybody tell me this thing, right? And then somebody raises their hand in the zoom, or you just select someone. And then once they've given their input, I want you to exaggerate your thank you. Um, and, and that's going to show students that that's what you want. And that's what you expect from them. And they're going to be more engaged and, and, and conversing more within those, those um, zoom conversations. And I will stop rambling. Um, any other questions. I have one in the Q&A. Oh, so all of the content topics. Uh, so Tiffany, you asked, I may have missed it, but where can we review all of the content topics? And I, I'm guessing that you're asking, where can you review the modules, the various modules that we have? So of course we have our website um, where you can kind of look at all of them. Um, we do have a, um, we do have a, a catalog of sorts, um, and so I could send that to you as well. 
Um, Tiffany, I'm just going to write down your name so I make sure I follow up with you and see what would be the easiest way for you to look at all of the content. And we actually just designed a new catalog. And so we are finalizing that right now. So I may just say, here's our website, but I'm going to get back to you in just a couple of days with the final catalog. Um, so that way you can easily flip through it and enjoy it. All right. Any other questions? Thank you all for being so engaged and asking questions and being part of this. I really enjoyed talking to all of you today about digital transformation, higher education. I'll send you out some information very soon. You can expect an email from me in 24 to 48 hours. Um, so as I collect all of the tech tips uh, that we got and um, compile those and, and get those emails sent out to you. But thank you again. I really appreciate all of you.